Hello everyone. Today's video is going to be about a 4017 decade counter. This chip has 11 outputs, a 0 to 9 cascading outputs and one carry out output used for uh, putting these chips in series if you wanted to count in more than one digit. And so we're going to take a look at its functions, a couple of the pitfalls for a hobby guy uh, in setting it up things not working, what to look out for, what not to look out for. It can also be used as a frequency divider, something we will get into also. I'll show you my circuit for that. Uh, I hope you liked the video. Remember to rate it up at the end and leave relevant comment down below. Thank you for watching. Let's go. Okay, as always, I like to take a quick look at the spec sheet um, to check some things out. Um, and it'll help us better understand what we're dealing with here. So, as we can see, the 4017B is a decade counter with 10 decoded outputs. Um, we're looking at a 10 megahertz speed up to 10 megahertz, 5 to 15 volt um, on the input voltage. I'm just going to use 5 volts. And so, looking at some of the characteristics table here, uh, looking at the voltage, the frequency here, the max frequency for 5 volts is actually 2.5 megahertz. For this example, it's not even going to matter, but I just like looking at these things so that uh, we can understand its limitations. In case we exceed them, we know where to come back and look. Um, here are the block diagrams which are a good way of looking at it for functional clarity, really. You have it, you know, the inputs here on the left and the outputs on the right. Um, because on the pins, uh, the actual chip, which is down here, uh, there we go, um, you can see the outputs are all over the place. So here we got uh, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, eight no, eight is here and nine so um because they're all over the place block diagrams are a pretty good way of uh, just looking at it and saying okay all the outputs here all the inputs here and that's what it's all about really uh, how it's going to function inputs and outputs so with all that said let's take a look at my uh, schematic and then we'll jump to the breadboard all right here's the schematic um, it might look crazy, um, but it's actually not that bad at all. Um, I set up the three inputs, which is clock, reset, and clock inhibit here. Um, I labeled all of these here. It's reset here on this pin. First of all, the, with the notch here on the chip, pin number one is here, number eight, one to eight. This is a 16 pin chip. Um, so one, eight, nine, all the way up to 16. So we go counterclockwise, um, starting at the notch, counterclockwise, one here around to 16. So 8 and 16 are the power, plus on 16, negative and ground on 8. And on the top of the pin here, on top of the chip, we have reset, clock, clock inhibit, and then we're getting to the outputs. So I set up some momentary uh, push buttons for clock, clock inhibit, and reset. Um, this way I can talk my way through it and you can look at it at slow speed and understand actually what's going on and when things happen. Also, I wired all the outputs, which we have 0 to 9, that's 10 obviously, and the carry out output. Um, so I I literally wired 0 to the bottom, 1 jumping over, all the way up um, for clarity. So that when we do clock in, we're going to see the outputs um, as they cascade through. Uh, it's pretty basic. Um, I do have resistors here tying down the three input switches. I'll explain that a little bit later when we look at the breadboard. That's it. It's time to move over to the breadboard. Here is the breadboarded circuit. As you can see, the chip is right down here. 
You'll have to excuse the mess of long jumper wires, but it's going to be quite evident. Here's the chip with all of the jumpers. Next to the chip are the 1K resistors that are tying all of the LEDs, all 10 LEDs here, which are going 0 to 9. It's powered up now with 0 LED lit, and of course the green over here, this green LED, is the carry out LED, which goes high for 5 of the 10 counts and goes low for the second five. Up here, this momentary switch right here, is the clock in. So I just advanced it one, two, three, four, five. And you can see the output carry out LED went off on number five. It's high for zero to four. It is low or off from 5 to 9, 6, 7. Here we just saw um, a skip. It actually didn't skip, but it cycled through the 8th LED and went to 9. It was an unwanted trigger. The reason for it is known. It's a common problem. It's called switch bouncing. And we're going to follow up with another video on switch debouncing to help prevent the unwanted triggering for chips such as these. So we'll see if we can recreate it. We went back to one here. As we can see, the carryout went high. Two. There it was again. Went from two to three to four with only a single press of the button, but there was a double trigger. It did happen. And you can see there it happened again. Now this is called switch bouncing and it can be overcome easily by debouncing the switch. And that is the reason that I wanted to talk about the three resistors that I tied in. The three resistors don't debounce the switch, but they do make it more stable when tying the switch um, into ground, just make it a lot more stable, just for demonstration purposes. Now, switch debouncing is a very uh, involved topic. There are many ways to debounce a switch. Um, please subscribe to this channel. You're going to be notified of when we come out with the debouncing circuit for switch debouncing um, like this. Now, I'm manually uh, using switches to trigger this, and the switch bouncing becomes an issue, as you can see from this. So, 9 it skipped 0 and went to 1, 2, 3, 4. Now, keep an eye. It went 1 to 4. I'm going to press one more time. The, the uh, carryout went off. So, as you can see, carryout is 0 to 4. And 5 to 9, it is off. Now, the reset button right here, no matter where it is, no matter where the output is, if I press reset, it always goes back to the zero. And the carryout always goes high. So I can advance again. Reset brings you back to zero. I'm going to advance it again. And we'll look at the clock inhibit. So if I press clock inhibit, no matter what I do with the input clock, it is just simply ignored. It's ignored. Similarly, the reset switch, if I press reset, and you can see when the switch goes down, which means it's leading edge or rising edge trigger, it immediately goes to zero. But if I keep uh, the reset high, it also acts as a clock inhibit. So, like the reset switch, the clock is a rising edge or leading edge trigger. So when I press it down and not on the release, it advances. That was, a, that was an unwanted trigger. 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. Here are the three inputs. 
um, and here are the decade outputs and the carry out output. One thing you may or may not see in the picture very well here, but I did put a point 0.1 microfarad cap across the power, which is uh, from pins 16 to 8. Um, and that also just helps with stability of the chip. Didn't put that on my circuit. Uh, one thing I didn't mention also was all of the resistors in this case for 5 volts were 1K resistors. I could have reduced them down a little bit to get a little brighter on the LEDs but I had them at hand easily and so that's what I used on all resistors here which I didn't uh, label them on my circuit diagram but they're all one kilo ohm resistors um, this is just being stored here it's absolutely nothing got to do with it and we have the power rail here of course which is positive five and negative which is tied into ground so in quick review we have the chip here uh, with the notch here Pin 1 here, 16 here, this is clock, clock inhibit, reset, clock advances, each pulse, reset always brings it back to zero, if reset is high it also acts as a clock inhibit, clock inhibit for while it's high also inhibits the effect of pulsing the clock. It does nothing as far as moving the position of the output. Reset always brings it back to zero. One double unwanted trigger. Be sure to check out my upcoming video on switch debouncing. There's, it's a pretty involved topic. We're going to simplify it and bring it down uh, to a very simple method that I've used and it works very, very reliably. Um, and I intentionally didn't incorporate it into this because I wanted to point out that this is a common problem, especially with beginners, is switch bouncing. And there are solutions out there. There's plenty of solutions out there. And we're going to go over it in detail. We're going to create it and we're going to make it repeatable. And then we're going to eliminate it with absolute certainty. Before we finish up, I just want to show you this chip wired up in a configuration where it's acting as a frequency divider. So I left the LEDs in there just to show you uh, that it is uh, that it's active, but they're not necessary. I put two probes, um, one on the input and one on the output. And in this case, I wired it to divide the frequency by six. So I'm inputting a frequency of 60. And so when dividing by six, the frequency is dropped down to 10. And so I've got it right here on my scope, both channels showing. If you look right here, you can see 60 hertz. That's channel one. I'm going to switch to channel two. And you can see it's 10 hertz. Now, 10 hertz for me is particularly useful because I have a project that I've been thinking about in making a time clock and a time clock with 10 Hertz is 10 cycles per second I can get one tenth of a second with this chip and then I can cascade it up to another chip uh, which will be counting in seconds and so on so that I can get uh, maybe a sports time clock uh, as a more major project for me coming up so look out for that coming up soon so this is the frequency divider. I will be making another video speaking specifically about what this circuit is, show you the circuit and how it was configured, the problems I encountered when I built it, because there were problems, it didn't work. Um, and so I let you know the pitfalls. So once again, subscribe to the channel. I hope you enjoyed the video. Good luck.